Well, that was a, a wonderful start. And yes, a little fireworks is always good. So thank you for that. Uh, I am Michelle Nellenbach. I'm, I direct our infrastructure work here at the BPC. And I'm thrilled to be joined by our panel of experts. Um, Keith Hennessy is the head of public infrastructure and P3s at Bechtel Infrastructure. Um, he has over 30 years in industry and investment banking experience. Um, his expertise includes infrastructure development, project finance, and capital raising. And Liliana Ortega with uh, Vice President for Project Development and Equity Bid Director at Parsons. She has over 10 years of experience in the construction and infrastructure management fields. And finally, Adam Ortiz, who is the director of the Department of Environment for Prince George's County, uh, was once the mayor of Edmonston, Maryland, and has spearheaded a really innovative program in Prince George's County we're going to talk about. So I'm going to dive right in. Um, Liliana and Adam, uh, you're, or Liliana and uh, Keith, sorry, your companies are two of the biggest construction um, engineering project management companies in the world. So you have projects in the US and, and across the, the globe, really. So can you talk a little bit about some of the projects you're working on, the role of private capital in those, and particularly emphasizing perhaps some not based here in the US that we might want to learn from? Sure, so thank you. Um, I'd like to highlight two projects. Uh, the first project, uh, is a project that we're currently constructing in the city of Edmonton, uh, Alberta, and Canada. It's a approximately $1.8 billion light rail project. So essentially, we're building a new uh, rail line from the downtown Edmonton city center out to a community that was not served by rail uh, access previously. Um, uh, in this project, this is an availability payment P3, which is fairly typical in the, in the Canadian market. Um, uh, our consortium, uh, which is so the, the private sector, is providing about a third of the capital, uh, essentially through a short-term uh, bank loan and, and long-term uh, rated bonds that were sold to institutional investors. Um, I think that the project is it's sort of typical of one type of P3, and, and, and one thing I want to highlight about it is I would say this is a good example of risk allocation, right? And so the way I think about the issue of risk in P3s is that there are certain risks that appropriately stay with um, uh, the government and there are risks that appropriately are transferred to, to the private sector. Um, and what I mean by that is in this, in this particular example, uh, for instance, uh, the city of Edmonton took the risk of getting the right of way, uh, literally the, the land to put the rail tracks in the middle of the street or on the side of the street. Uh, that's something that's very difficult for a private company like my company to go do um, because it's sort of a, it's central to municipal government. However, we've taken many substantial risks. We've taken the risk of uh, labor productivity, labor costs, taken the risk of a vast array of material equipment pricing. Uh, and oh, the overall performance, and we've accepted the risk associated with the, with the financing as well. Um, that's a good example of what I'll call a typical sort of availability payment P3. The other example I wanted to highlight is a project that we've we constructed and, and finished a few years ago, which is much closer to home. It's the Silver Line extension of the metro uh, out through uh, Northern Virginia, through Tyson's Corner. Uh, that first phase that we built uh, terminated at Wheelie Avenue in, in Reston. So to, to the, uh, one of the earlier questions to the ambassador, uh, we had in originally in our scope to build a large parking structure at uh, Willie Avenue. Uh, WMATA ultimately, uh, we, we worked with them and sort of advised them on how to finance the project as well, but they ultimately took that parking structure out of our design build scope and awarded it to a um, commercial real estate developer. And what that commercial real estate developer got in return for the, for the obligation to build the parking structure was the development rights uh, around the, um, uh, the rail station at Willie Avenue. So that's a good example of what I would just call um, transit-oriented development. The ambassador referred to it as value capture. In that particular case, um, uh, there was the transfer was essentially the, the cost of, of that parking structure. There's other examples. Um, uh, in other parts of the world where you could monetize or essentially securitize the future increase in property values or other fees that government might, might get from that uh, real estate development. And so um, that is an opportunity. Um, I, I'm not aware of that happening in the U.S. yet. Perhaps it has, but I'm not aware of it. 
But that's a good uh, example of the kind of thing that could be done that's fairly innovative. Great, thank you. And Liliana? Sure. Um, thank you. I just would like to highlight, you know, in Parsons, we have the ability to be uh, in a P3 project in the private side and in the public side. That is because we have some uh, engineering capabilities and we advise clients uh, as general engineering consultant or owner's representative uh, in, in some of the P3 projects we participate. And as opposed to that, we can also uh, select to be in the in the private sector uh, participating in a, in a team. We do participate in teams, uh, uh, you know, in the design uh, team, uh, in the construction team, and in some cases in the equity side as well, investing in projects. So I think this is, uh, you know, uh, uh, something to highlight because in, in Parsons we have, uh, you know, this beauty to, to have experience in both sides of the table, which is, uh, Pretty enrichment not only for us but also for the for the uh, private and for the and for our partners uh, uh, as well. So in the, in those terms, we have uh, experiences, uh, you know, in several countries. Uh, I will highlight uh, this project in Canada. We have now under construction the Regina Bypass is uh, uh, the bypass in, in Saskatoon area. Uh, we are there as equity partner construction a joint venture partner and, and the design lead for that project. Uh, that project is, is going pretty well. Uh, actually, uh, it's being uh, delivered the first phase of the project and, and, the, and it's still under construction the, the remaining uh, uh, sections of, of the project. Uh, it's been a great experience, uh, you know, to work in the, in the Canadian sector uh, as an equity member. They are a very mature uh, country in terms of P3s. And we are also trying to implement some, some of our knowledge in, in Petris in, in the US. Uh, we are participating you know, in several roles in the US in projects. Um, you know, I will highlight uh, the Gordy Howe project between Detroit and Canada. We are in the owner side in that project. So it's been uh, you know, uh, a very long procurement process for the, for the project. It's been interesting to have uh, you know, this bipartition uh, project that is kind of unique so far. And uh, obviously we hope the, the project progresses as we are expecting it. Uh, I was, you know, discussing the project with, this morning with Ketan. It was uh, brought to my attention that they just submitted the, the bids. Uh, oh. yeah, we, we, so just, we, just, we just bid it a week ago. Yeah. <coughs> so and what are we building in Gordy Howe's name? Just curious. It's it's a bridge between oh, Detroit and Windsor. Okay, it's thanks. A, uh, international bridge, hmm. and uh, uh, well, Kit is very familiar with the project since uh, you know Bechtel is is, is bidding in one okay. of the teams. So uh, we were just discussing the complexity the project has, not only because of the project itself, but also because it is located in a, in the border basically. So you have customs in the in oh, the yeah. in, in both sides of the border, and in addition to that, you ja you have. A, a bridge that is uh, uh, not only challenging, but all the facilities that are accommodated for uh, servicing that bridge are, are very challenging. In. And, and not to interrupt, but um, given that it's called the Gordie Howe International Bridge, you can guess who is paying for the bridge, right? 100% of the bridge <laughs> is being paid for by the Canadians. Um, and uh, I always I call it a P3 on top of a P3, because it is a P3, um, but then the Canadian government will collect all the tolls for the bridge. There's an agreement between the two governments. The U.S. side will not collect tolls, and so the Canadians will ultimately pay themselves back over time through the tolls. But the U.S. portion will also be tolled. No. No. Uh, uh, yeah, no. well, the bridge is tolled. The bridge, the bridge is, is okay. tolled. And it the, all goes to Canada. The Canadians collect the tolls. All right, well, they're paying for it. They're paying for I it, I guess, yeah. okay. Most, uh, multiple billions of dollars, so, yes. So. Well, that, that's great, and certainly um, we know that P3s work in the transportation sector. We have a number of them around here. Uh, I want to get Adam in here, because one of the projects that we at the BBC love to highlight for folks is what you all have done in Prince George's County. In part, we've done a lot of work around the water infrastructure issues, and communities across the country are struggling with how to pay for stormwater upgrades. Um, they're costing millions of dollars often for communities who simply don't have those resources. And so Prince George's County um, has a really innovative approach to dealing with this. So Adam, you want to tell us a little bit about what y'all are doing? 
Sure, thanks Michelle, and it's a pleasure to be here with everybody this morning. So Prince George's County, for those who aren't familiar, is the big county to the east of here in Washington, D.C. We um, border the district, and we're in the heart of the Chesapeake Bay. Um, the state of Maryland has been very pro uh, progressive in trying to meet uh, Clean Water Act mandates and controlling stormwater runoff, which is the fastest growing source of uh, pollution in the Bay. The jurisdictions have struggled um, historically for more than 20 years to, to meet the demands, um, mostly because the scale of the work is so great um, in the current phase permit that we have uh, for controlling stormwater runoff to the EPA. We have to treat 15,000 acres, uh, which means that we have to capture the runoff from those impervious acres like parking lots and roads. It has to be naturally filtered before that water then goes into a local stream. Um, and that 15,000 acres translates to um, you know, something in the neighborhood of uh, 20 or 30,000 small projects, um, and that will cost about a billion dollars. So um, no government has been able to meet that, those kind of mandates. So uh, for Prince George's, you know, and the ambassador made the comment that you know, everything is local and contextual. Um, so for us, we designed a P3 um, uh, with a dedicated funding source. The funding source is coming from property owners. They get a fee assessed based on the amount of impervious surface that they have. So for the average homeowner, that's uh, about 40 bucks a year. For a small shopping center, that's about 600 bucks a year. And for FedEx Field, Redskins Stadium, it's about uh, $52,000 a year. Thank you, Dan Snyder. <laughs> so um, we, that funds the program. Um, but we know that the government, to the ambassadors, well, we just don't build stuff well in, in, in the public sector, especially something as decentralized as that. So our P3 um, is uh, basically a concessionaire type agreement. Uh, the, the firm that won the contract was Corvius Solutions, and their background actually is in building uh, and operating uh, military housing and 14 um, uh, military installations uh, throughout the country. and. Um, you know, we work together hand in hand, but they design, build, and maintain these assets. So we're finishing uh, the first pilot phase uh, of uh, this green infrastructure program. It's been a, a three-year phase. Uh, they had to treat 2,000 acres um, in that period of time, which is, as far as I know, um, the most ambitious schedule that's ever been done um, in this field. And uh, we're wrapping it up now, and they're going to meet those goals. The, um, there's a few uh, pieces, you know, and I heard in the questions uh, among the audience about risk and about you know, serving the public interest. So we built into the P3 a number of guarantees that the public interest is always um, preserved. So uh, the first is that um, you know, sort of a, the, there's all the typical stuff about construction, uh, the bonding, the liability. You know, the stuff has to work and has to be done on time and on budget. Um, we built in, um, Corvius earns half of their fee based on meeting certain performance metrics, no matter what. So there's that piece. Um, they also maintain the asset for 30 years. So they have to build it right, and if it's not functioning properly, that's on them. So the maintenance is built in. So they have a vested interest in doing it right and protecting the public interest on the front end. And then also, you know, the thing that, you know, we're really proud of is that um, we built in a number of socioeconomic um, deliverables into the, the P3 contract with them. And that's a, a unique thing. So um, for us in Prince George's and those of you who are in the region, that's probably most people here, you know that Prince George's is sort of the underdog county in the region where we have the, the, the weakest economic base, we, we don't have the commercial tax base, and most of our residents come you know, into the district here in Montgomery or Northern Virginia to go to work every day. So we have you know, really a labor uh, workforce drain. So we wanted to correct that issue um, by helping to invest um, you know, this infrastructure program into the businesses of Prince George's County. It's a, over the three years, it's a $100 million investment. And uh, with our other programs, it works out altogether about $40 million a year of investment. So, um, so we built into the contract that um, you know, base, roughly 50% of all contracting has to go to county-based, small, and minority businesses. And, uh, and also, uh, Corvius has to oversee a mentor-protege uh, business development program for small contractors. And what that has been able to do is to take um, firms that do landscaping, uh, do excavation, do construction, um, have them better compete and be more sophisticated in dealing with water infrastructure, which is a unique um, you know, a unique technology and an emerging technology to specialize in it and, and to be able to win our contracts, but then 
also be able to compete throughout the region, throughout the country on water projects because it's such a highly specialized field. Um, so long story short, uh, they've exceeded all those metrics. Um, instead of being around 50 percent, we're between 80 and 90 percent local contracting. Uh, we've seen firms that uh, not only won the contracts in our county, but now we're winning contracts in Pennsylvania uh, and in Baltimore, and also we're attracting businesses. So for the county-based requirement, and I'll wrap up my comments here, um, for, for the county-based requirement, that's a big driver. So we've been able to attract a, a number of firms from other states to locate in Prince George's County. And uh, our biggest maintenance contractor um, actually moved their headquarters from Manassas uh, to Forestville, Prince George's County, to be able to compete. So we're growing the economy here. We're serving the public, and I think that we've managed the risk pretty well, at least so far. Great. So I, I want to dive into some of this. So as the ambassador had, had mentioned, um, you know, a lot of this is bringing the, the public along. And so, um, you know, $40 a year on a water bill doesn't sound like a lot, but for certain populations, low income, it, it, it is. And I, I can recall working for a member of Congress who we never heard from folks about water issues, and all of a sudden one of the cities imposed a $1 stormwater fee and the phones lit up. So I think you, those are tough issues, and y'all were talking about toll roads and such. So describe how that begin so you start working with a local government or a state government um, who reticent to do tolls obviously they're not very popular don't want to increase in sewer rates um, how does that conversation how do you get them to think outside the box in terms of creative financing and get comfortable with how some of this with bringing in the private sector to do these things um, sure. So I'll, I'll maybe take a crack at that first. Um, so when you're when you're dealing in the in the public infrastructure arena, um, the, the com community engagement, the the messaging um, uh, is in incredibly important and is really sort of part and parcel of everything. So it starts at, at the very front end. Um, I guess I would echo some of the things that, the, that uh, Ambassador Hockey said, which are you have to really emphasize and point out uh, the advantages and the benefits of the, the, the new infrastructure. Um, I think when you're, when you're increasing capacity or providing something new, if it's literally a greenfield uh, toll road, so there's not been a highway there before and now there's going to be a highway, the public generally has been more accepting of, of a greenfield asset uh, in a lot of cases, not all the time, but I would say in, in, in certainly in a lot of cases. Um, if you're expanding capacity on an existing system and there's a user fee for those people who are going to use that incremental capacity, that also is, I'm going to just say, more acceptable to the general public than everybody paying a tax or a user fee for some from, from new construction. Um, I also think that, um, you know, that for particularly at the local level, um, you, you know, you need to think about infrastructure very broadly. And the, there was a comment made earlier that a lot of infrastructure, well, most infrastructure, first of all, is owned at the state and local level, and then a lot of infrastructure is owned in pr uh, privately you know, anyway. And there is a lot of infrastructure that pays for itself. I, I want to sort of use the example of communications. So you're starting to see a lot of cities, counties, towns uh, providing free public Wi-Fi access, right? So. And that, um, those um, arrangements typically either are a P3 or look like some kind of concession type agreement. And the, the interesting thing about the communications infrastructure is that there's a very strong underlying economic and business case for, for that investment, meaning it more than pays for itself, right? So a private entity can come in, uh, whether it's Prince George's County or Washington, D.C., or, or and, and they, so this has been done in, Kansas City, New York, um, um, Little Rock, Arkansas just did a contract actually for this. Um, and someone can come in, a private company can come in, install uh, infrastructure, provide free Wi-Fi internet connectivity within some geographic area, and then they sell advertising essentially off of um, the bandwidth. And uh, the revenue stream is such that in fact, uh, the concessionaire can return a portion of the revenue stream back to the municipality. So that's a, sort of a really good example of new infrastructure uh, that is using the latest technology uh, and is p more than paying for itself and is actually an incremental revenue stream. 
And so uh, I've kind of used that example because not everything um, you know, is transit. And, and, and one of the issues with transit right, is that fundamentally it requires a government subsidy. Right? So fundamentally, um, the vast majority of rail lines you know, do not pay for themselves. So, so that is the underlying issue in, in transit, I think. Yeah, and I just would like to elaborate a little bit on the feasibility, financial feasibility of a project. You know, not all the projects are set up to be a P3, for instance. Every project is different, has its own future, and every client is different as well. They have their own interests and their, and their, their own capacities. So I think that one of the uh, things that may be very useful for the governments that are considering undertaking P3 is not only uh, get informed and evaluate the project, since the very beginning to see if the P3 will be uh, you know, a, a source of uh, financing that will be possible for them in the long term because as, as Kit said, some, so many projects in the transportation field need uh, some sort of grants or contributions in the long term. So uh, not all the projects or not all the clients are set up for, for that. So that is something important to, to consider since the very beginning of the project. And also, I think the, the client has to be uh, you know, knowledgeable or well advised about the P3s. And not only the client itself, but the office that moves the procurement around so that they can communicate to the community the benefits of the project. Because sometimes it's, it's a communication issue, right? Sometimes you know that a project is going to be uh, pretty successful because it's going to solve many issues, but you don't have the, the, the a proper channel to communicate those benefits to the public. So I think that preparing a very well-structured communication plan since the very beginning that you structure a procurement is key. Because you need to advise the community on all the benefits that they are going to receive uh, for exchange of a toll, a user fee, an incremental tax, you know, wh whatever they are paying back is, is, is worth because all the benefits that they could receive by developing such infrastructure, infrastructure that in other ways shouldn't be built as soon or as well maintained as in a traditional procurement. Okay, yeah, right. Um, and Adam, so. <sighs> How did you start this process? Because um, to Eliana's point, some projects are not are not meant to be P3s, and there has to be this evaluation. And a lot of communities don't have that expertise. Like you, uh, you were just saying that they don't know that there's a P3 option. They just sort of assume they're going to go down the typical path. Uh, Prince George's County is a larger jurisdiction, um, probably has a bit more sophistication than some of our, our smaller communities do. Um, what was, how did you all decide this was the way to do that? Sure, great question. Uh, I think there's probably two things. And uh, you know, part of it is the benefit of being in the proximity of Washington, is that we're sort of part of the conversation here. Uh, we, uh, we're, we're geeky and <laughs> geeky policy people. Uh, so, um, so these are you know, not new ideas and they've sort of been in the mix. Um, so I think it's important to engage in you know, national policy conversations or at least be listening, so that's one piece. And then the second piece, and it goes to um, one of the comments earlier um, you know, about risk, uh, is um, we kind of did this because we kind of had to do it. You know? And I'm not saying we had to do it like we were forced to do it, but the status quo has been failure. You know, the current model has been failure. And, and I think that was sort of the ambassador's point in the beginning of, of his comments. Um, we needed a new model to be able to do stuff better. So, uh, you know, for us, you know, there is risk in going to a model that wasn't quite like this. There were some examples, um, absolutely. But, you know, I felt and uh, our team uh, felt and our county executive, Sharon Baker, also felt there's more risk in not changing. Great. Um Really good point, actually. Um, so one thing I wanted to touch on really quickly, um, and the, it was part of the ambassador's discussion too, is, and one thing our council has identified, is there are delays in the process, and those are a huge hurdle for private investors. They don't want to be, and I think it's rare that you have a federal infrastructure project or state infrastructure project that takes 10 years to get through the permitting process, but that, that fear is out there, and so, uh, there's been a lot of discussion on how to how to speed up that process. The Trump administration has obviously proposed a two-year timeline, and others. What are there? Ch are there specific issues that you continually come up against in your projects? Sure. So um, um, let me start. So so there are. 
we're good. Uh, <laughs> uh, we're having infrastructure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there are definitely recurring themes, both in the procurement process or getting a project ready for delivery, and then in once you're in actual delivery or construction mode. So in the sort of preparation phases, it, it's really, um, I would say, very much an issue of um, um, uh, funding, securing funding and making sure that that's stable and not changing. It's very much related to uh, permitting um, uh, and certainly the environmental approval process as well. Those are sort of the big ones. The, the other issue that we frequently see is, uh, is really a political consideration, which is change, changes in um, the, um, the decision makers. The, and, okay. and so if there's an election and a new mayor comes in or a new governor, I think frequently you see a new prioritization of cap large capital projects. Sometimes that leads to outright changes, sometimes not. But that is, and the, the timing of these procurements, frequently it's driven by the, the election cycle. So how do you respond to that? The, like for Bechtel and Parsons, like you, you know an election is coming up. Like how does that factor into your decision making well, in doing this? You, you have, you know, a kind of visibility about the, about the project timetable mm -hmm. at the very beginning and you uh, inform and get knowledge about, you know, how is the political atmosphere going on when elections are happening. Uh, if this is, if, if that the, the project that you are studying is uh, uh, going to be popular in the community, it's is very possible that the next uh, elected official, uh, you know, assigns the project to the, to, the pro, to the program as well because there is a, a factual need of the project. Right. So that is a very important piece in, in P3. The P3 uh, has to be needed in order to be uh, developed uh, fully in the, in, the, in, in the course of the, of the um, uh, project. Uh, it, it is also helping to the community accept the project. You know, and, and um, it also uh, reinforces the the feasibility of the project, not only financially, because you will have if, if you need something, you are gonna uh, find the resources to to pay for it, you know, or, or to go through. But you also will have, a, you know, to to solve an issue. You have solved an issue by developing that project, and. It's 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 a it's a a, a very good uh, you, I will say political slogan for for an elected official to be there promoting a project that is badly needed by the community. Right. No, that's a very good point. And I think, Adam, to your point, like, I the way you, it seems you have set up the project. In part, you're you're meeting a regulatory requirement that something be done with stormwater. So in some ways, that protects you from some of that political upheaval. But it sounds like you've really um, ingratiated this among the community. So it's generally, I would assume, receiving positive response among folks. Yeah, thanks. So, you know, all social policy is uh, uh, integrated, right? You know, there are crime issues are also social issues, are also infrastructure issues, are also employment issues. The same is true for environment. So we were mindful not to just say, like, oh, we have to do this because the EPA is making us do it. So, you know, we... we <laughs> <laughs> Although that's true, uh, but uh, you know this is also a, a workforce program. This is also a local business development program. Uh, this is a beautification program to parts of the county that aren't seeing a lot of economic transformation. We could put green space. We could put trees. You know we can make properties more beautiful. So uh, you know we really tried to um, you know make this a thoughtful program that is truly integrated. It's truly a quality of life program. It's not just an environmental program. And we spent a lot of time on the front end reaching out to the big stakeholders. A lot of time with the churches, hey, this is what we're thinking about. What do you think? Do you have any ideas? Um, with uh, businesses, shopping center owners, apartment building owners, civic associations, and, uh, and we had, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of community more organizing in a way, but on the front end, hey, this is what we gotta do. This is what we're thinking about doing. What do you think? How can this work for you? And then this way we had the buy-in. So by the time um, our proposal went to the county council, uh, we had, unanimous votes and it was done. That's great. That's great. So I want to turn it over to you all and um, open it up for questions in the audience. Do we have mics circulating? Uh, maybe up here? Oh, that's fine. 
Oh. Hi, Zach Schaefer with Infrastructure Week. Uh, thank you all for uh, for being here. A question for for all of you, Adam, as a you know a, a, on the client side. Um, I'm curious how you went about building a team. The, the Ambassador Hockey talked about the importance of building teams on the client side to understand the procurements um, and the options available um, to work with the, the you know the vendors and the providers. I'm curious how you went about developing that team on your end, and then. You know, for for Keith and Liliana, what are sort of the you know the, the qualifications that you feel are most valuable on the client side, the, the, the clients you're working with, that makes for a smooth, successful P3 process, knowing that this is different every time. Uh, thanks. Great question, Zach. So um, you know, we we did spend a lot of time in sort of pre-planning and um, you know getting buy-in to outside stakeholders, but also. In, inside stakeholders, because you may have heard that government can be siloed from time to time. Um, uh, so we had folks at the table, particularly finance and procurement and others, and um, we were able to structure a contract that helped address some of their problems. So procurement didn't want to deal with, you know, uh, man, uh, you know, procurements for a family of 60 contractors constantly doing, you know, 200 projects. They really appreciated the efficiency. They just wanted to guarantee that, you know, the, the county-based firms you know, we're, had a shot and that we were meeting our minority targets and so that was built in. Um, also, you know, the, the, the great thing about a, a new idea is that government folks are kind of bored of the same stuff. I mean, there are stereotypes about the bureaucrats, you know, in the cubicles, but there are folks who want to, are fired up about stuff. So um, those folks did gravitate and did want to be part of the team and, you know, we really welcome that energy and, um, man, so far so good. For, from the um, private side perspective, what do we see in a client uh, that make us, you know, uh, be confident that the process will go through? Well, uh, I think Adam mentioned, you know, the the, the um, uh, energy or the or the client knowledge about the process. Uh, we also um, value that the client has the legal framework set up to work with. You know, there is P3 legislation out there in two-thirds of the country only and at different levels. Uh, not all the communities or uh, the counties are experienced or even have the, not only the legislation, but have the, the, the experience, the capacity, and willingness to undertake a P3. Some of them don't understand P3s or underestimate the effort that takes to develop a P3. So we really value that these clients are well advised if they don't have the capabilities and they are aware of the challenges that they are facing undertaking a P3. Uh, it's also uh, very common these days to see a political champion for a project. That makes us to feel confident that the project will move because this will be the elected official priority and uh, they will be pushing and trying to uh, you know, go ahead of the challenges that the project uh, represents, not only in the delivery, but I will say mostly in the procurement side. Because most, most of the uh, delays in projects in Peter is going back to, 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 to your mm -hmm. uh, previous question, yeah. Michelle, are in the procurement process, not in the delivery phase. And many of those projects are canceled or you know, in a standby for years because there is some piece that is missing in there. And if, if you see the projects that are being delivered that, that have been awarded and, and, and under contract, not many of them have delays. Okay. So that's something to, to take into account. The, the, only, the only thing I would add uh, at, to what's been already said is that um, at, the, at the one extreme, the, the best situation uh, from the private sector's perspective is where you have a state or a municipality that has a dedicated um, alternative delivery office or P3 office. So uh, uh, Washington, D.C. is a good example, which is uh, actually fairly innovative in this regard and has a dedicated P3 office that is procuring infrastructure for the district. Um, you, have, you have authorities like the Port Authority in, in New York and New Jersey that has done several P3s now and um, has a very, I would say, professional, knowledgeable team of people, um, and they know how to, to go do this. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, you've got someone like Infrastructure Ontario in Canada, which is a great example of a large, dedicated procurement um, uh, force that has, in fact, delivered, you know, I guess by now, tens of billions of dollars of infrastructure for, for Ontario. 
we have any other questions? Um, over, we'll go over there. Yes. Rick Ryback with Just Economics. Thanks for everything. I just wanted to correct the, I think there was a statement made that transit requires subsidy. Just wanted to, and I'm sure everybody on the panel knows this, but uh, in Hong Kong, the Transit Authority owns uh, development rights adjacent to and above the stations. They've leased out those development rights, and the Transit Authority in Hong Kong is profitable. I mean, it does not require, it's self-sufficient and profitable. Yeah, I think I made that comment, and I'll, I'll self-correct and say many, uh, tr many transit uh, uh, projects uh, require subsidy. No. Is it Susan? Yes. Yeah. I would ask, it seems to me, if they were given the air rights, there's a original subsidy, but I don't know the name. Going back to um, Infrastructure Weekly's credit, it seems to me, at least at the federal level, which is where I look at these things, the, the imbalance in knowledge and expertise seems huge to me. And, and whether the federal government is going to invest in, you know, in having something like a dedicated thing with the kind of expertise that could compete in negotiations with the private sector for either big P3 developments or for even things like privatizing a historical asset, you know, or giving them, you know, the hotel, the Monaco. So how do you think about it? That seems to me to be our biggest challenge. Um, so how, what thoughts do we have on how we could deal with that at the federal level short of having GSA have a whole office of people who do nothing but that and somehow have been stolen from the private sector um, to produce expertise? One other thing I wanted to say, those of us who are skeptical never think the government should be actually doing the building. Okay, we want to be clear about that. Our concern is the way the financing is designed. So I'll, I'll take a crack at that. So there is a, um, uh, it's more than a seed, I would say. So within the federal um, Department of Transportation, there is the uh, Build America Bureau, which is in essence, um, I mean, I'm going to call it a small bank, or not even a small bank. You know, it, it has uh, oversight over several credit programs. Um, and there is certainly expertise there. There is a, a real established track record of providing finance to projects. They have uh, valuation criteria. They have a staff of people that have been doing this for quite a while now. Um, you know, there, there has been talk about uh, a national infrastructure bank. I mean, I think if, if uh, that is one idea, um, but <coughs> if you wanted to have a national infrastructure bank, the seeds of it, I would say, are right there in, in the Department of Transportation today. And, um, you know, so that's an example of, um, of a place where I think there is is certainly a, a good level of expertise and uh, experience that could be built uh, to other asset classes uh, if, if, if that was something the government wanted to do. But to build off that a little bit, because Elena, you had mentioned if you go into a community and they don't have that expertise, um, how do you work with them? Like, do you refer them to other folks? Do you just say, well, you should just go the municipal bond route? What, how do we help those local communities get that expertise? Well, basically, I will say that the first, very first thing they will have to, they will need <laughs> to have is willingness to learn. So they need mm -hmm. to be, you know, open-minded and willing to, to learn about that process. And there is a transformational change they need to do uh, within their organization. So uh, there is like, like a, um, a goal that they need to get accomplished internally first. And sometimes it's, it's pretty easy. Adam, Adam mentioned uh, the, their, the project there. They have like a very enthusiastic staff that was you know, ready to go and uh, willing to, to learn and, and be advised. So, so I think that is a very important piece in the, in the equation, very, the, the very first one. And then you. Once you have that, then you basically uh, try to educate in the, in the uh, technical skills, in the technical areas, in the financial areas, and you complement the team. In, in the um, public sector, they don't have to have a full team to develop a project, but they have to have uh, you, the knowledge to understand the, ver the different pieces of the projects and the advisors in place. To have trusted advisors and experienced advisors in a project is key. I mean, you have to have 
uh, as a public entity, advisors who have had done that before and have experience not only in, in, in that particular uh, part of the, of the country, but you know, like have broad experience and there are many advisors now in the, in the P3 industry willing to uh, educate and go through the process of educating a client and, and try to advise them along all the steps in, in the project, so. Do we have any, I think we have a question in the back. Hi, my, my name is Rima Oweid. I'm with the U.S. Department of Energy. I, I had a question just building off of what Liliana uh, mentioned earlier. Um, there is a lot of inertia at the state and local level to engage in various types of projects because of the, as you guys mentioned, the um, lack of expertise and, and discomfort with how to proceed on projects because of the hurdles with respect to financing. And, and, and we've heard from pri private sector folks that certain projects don't move forward because of the amount of brain damage required to get people up to speed, particularly at the local level. Um, and, and we know that there's a variation of, ex of, of, of sophistication there. So whose, responsi whose responsibility is it then to educate those less sophisticated pro um, uh, decision makers um, on the government side, um, knowing that the private sector doesn't necessarily always have the appetite to make that investment because of the uncertainty of whether things will move forward or not? It, it, we meant, especially in the absence of a national infrastructure bank, um, you, you know, you've got expertise at the DOT level, but should, are there other places within the federal government um, that should explore that a little more to play a role that would involve educating folks in order to start helping create certain pathways? I guess that's sort of a fully loaded question. Well, I I do believe it's a shared responsibility between the public and the private sector. You know, as a public um, entity or as a, as a, as a federal entity, uh, well, you are uh, supposed to give uh, all the other public entities uh, the tools they need to develop the projects. You know, and education is, is a, big, a big piece in, in, in this factor. Uh, but also, the private sector, because it's interested in doing business in the, in the public sector, I think it's encouraged to, to you know, develop a relationship with the public sector and try to educate them. Um, so I think it's, it's a shared responsibility, and I think that is being done today. Uh, one of the challenges that, that I, I, I personally found over these years in, in my experience in, in the U.S. is that you know, we as private sector try to go there and educate the clients. And once you think that you mostly have, uh, you know, done your job with a specific agency, then elected officials change. And you have to start the process over and over. So is there when I think that the responsibility of the public or federal government comes into place? Because they, there should be a continuity, not only in the elected officials, but in the knowledge elected officials may have, especially for uh, procuring contracts or, or, or at least trying to have the knowledge of the alternatives they have for procuring those contracts. So I just want to give everyone a little update on timing. Uh, Congressman Graves should be here in about two minutes. He was running behind, so I'm just going to keep taking questions until he comes in, and hopefully y'all can stick with us for a little bit longer. Um, up here on the aisle. Thanks. Uh, my name is Neil Stolman. I'm with the Treasury Department. And I just wanted to mention that uh, we've been interested in infrastructure for a while, and we also have some areas of, of expertise within Treasury, uh, starting with the uh, Build America initiative that President Obama launched in 2014. Uh, as part of that, we wrote a couple of white papers on public-private partnerships and disseminated those to private investors and state and local government officials in an effort to you know, spread knowledge around to areas where, where some increase in skills or capacity was, was warranted, and uh, the Trump administration is still interested in pursuing uh, P3s as, as well. So we have, you know, financing expertise and some, uh, you know, academic type uh, areas of uh, knowledge as well, and and when P3s make sense and and when they do not. So we've been trying to push that uh, knowledge out. Uh, especially in the area of risk sharing, where 
as was mentioned, you know, sometimes the public sector may take on too much risk, sometimes the private sector may take on inordinate risk, so it's important to get a balance of people handling the risk that they're best suited to handle, and, uh, as, as uh, you mentioned uh, b before. So I just, just wanted to mention that I don't have a specific question. Uh, uh, and there's a gentleman in the back eager to ask, yes. Yeah, I'm Thomas Ward. Uh, excuse me. I'm Thomas Ward. I'm a Global P3 leader. And okay. one thing to be noted is, one, Virginia does have a infrastructure bank on the books, a statutory basis for it, and they do have a P3 center through the DOT. But uh, what was interesting this morning is I was at the municipal bond discussion, and what came up at that is P3s can be a game changer if and only if it becomes a tax issue on the equity side of it. And that's the big discussion that's been going on for a while. At the last infrastructure week, there was a, two different panels that discussed it. Here at the bipartisan, there was a discussion about it two years ago as well and last year. And that's what I think is where the real question comes into play is how do the municipal bonds versus the P3 equity come into play and the tax issues with it, because like the PDAs were not part of the tax bill that came through. Uh, so I'll, 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 I'll take a crack at that. Um, you know, I think, I think if, if you're a government official and you're weighing different delivery models, you need to look uh, critically and analytically at, at a number of things. And I think um, the, the, you need to be able to quantify the advantages of moving to the P3 model. It's just a simple and very clear fact that the municipal bond market is large, liquid, cheap, <laughs> efficient, and, and, and proven, right? And, every, and, and it is how we have financed um, uh, local and state government um, uh, for a very long time. And, and so there's a fairly high hurdle bar it, to prove or demonstrate that there's actually really quantifiable advantages to move to a P3. Um, it's clear that um, uh, the private sector has a cost of capital um, associated with the equity uh, and needs a return to, to make a project uh, attractive. That being said, um, one of the advantages of P3s is that there is a complete focus on uh, optimizing life cycle costs, which is not the standard baseline in, in the way infrastructure is procured typically. We, we typically disaggregate the design, the construction, the operations, and the maintenance. Those, those are typically, all four of those are disaggregated. Putting them all together in a P3 provides an opportunity to make trade-offs. This is exactly, Bechtel is exactly what we do when we're looking at P3. Should I spend more money on this building or this structure, make it stronger, last longer, the capital dollars go up, but my maintenance is going to go down for 30, 40 years? We look at those and we have our engineers and finance people analyze those trade-offs. You also, um, um, I do think that while there are many um, uh, municipal entities that have lots of experience uh, building infrastructure, what the private sector has global experience and has experience across all kinds of asset classes. So you know, my company, we're very global. We're doing rail projects today in the Middle East, the United Kingdom, Canada, and the United States, and Australia. And so we see the technology and all the best practices, and we obviously are going to try to um, expand and grow our business by bringing those things to bear, because it's, it's in our interest to do that. And so there, are, there is a transfer of technology, best practices, industry standards, and all that, which can generate uh, outright cost savings of, of one form or another. Um, and, and, and you need to be able to, I think you need to have a pro process that encourages that kind of innovation and allows companies to bring that to the table because that is part of the value proposition of a, of a P3. Um, the, other, the other thing which, which I, I think um, doesn't always get attention is if I'm, if I'm a mayor, maybe I have uh, five projects that are really important to me that I really want to get done politically, but I only have the capital budget for three. Uh, you know, a, a P3, in essence, it, it, a P3, particularly if we're talking about an availability payment structure, is really just a financing vehicle, right? It, it, and so you can stretch your capital dollars further um, and get more done faster, which is not a, um, which might generate economic growth uh, for, for a city or a community. Um, um, and so you need to think about it, I think, in that context as well. But I think the, the question is, is sort of spot on in that the municipal bond market 
is a great innovation and a great asset for the for the country. Uh, it probably doesn't get us the you know completely to where the country needs to be, though. Uh, that's my thought, at least. Um, so we just heard that Congressman Graves is still stuck in a hearing. So I think we will have allowed that to be our our final question. It is uh, 11:30, and uh, I think. Adam, Eliana, and Keith, particularly for staying up here longer than I said you would be. So I appreciate that. I apologize about the congressman, and uh, thank you all for, for coming. Enjoy the rest of Infrastructure Week.